Thanks for tuning in to Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson, with Category 5. I'm a technologist from Barrie, Ontario. And here's my beautiful daughter, Natalia, who's joining us tonight because this is her third birthday. We've already got phone calls coming in. Uh, whoever's calling the... Uh, <laughs> Whoever's calling the line there, just call back in just a minute. Natalia is celebrating her third birthday today, so I promised her that uh, she'd be allowed on the air with me. You having fun? You see yourself? You have anything to say to everybody around the world? Say hello. Say hi. She sees her. Oh, and she got markers uh, for her birthday. Um, so <laughs> she's drawn bracelets all over herself. Thanks for coming on the show with me, babe. Yeah, bracelet. Looks nice, doesn't it? It's very pretty. It's a red bracelet. And we'll never, yeah, we'll never be able to take that one off. <laughs> well, happy birthday, sweetheart. Happy birthday. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Look over there. Bye-bye. And she doesn't know where to look because we've got monitors all over the place. There's about six of them. So there they are, right there. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, tonight we're going to be looking at some pretty cool stuff, uh, partitioning your hard drive using free Mommy, tools. A movie. Yeah, we're on a movie. Okay, take care, babe. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> so that's uh, the little girl that you hear once in a while calling down from upstairs through the air vents while I'm on the air. Anyways, like I was saying, tonight we're looking at partitioning our hard drive. Uh, without losing any data, we're going to be using free tools. Um, if you've got a hard drive that's like, you know, you, you want to split it up, make another partition. This is how we're going to be able to do that without losing the data on the first partition, so we don't need to back it up and move things over or anything like that. Uh, also, configuring X screensaver in Ubuntu. One of the problems with uh, with the Linux operating system uh, with GNOME is that we don't get the X screensaver settings that is uh, usually uh, included with KDE, um, so we're going to be addressing that issue today. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. It's time for bed. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be taking a look at that, the X screensaver uh, issue in Ubuntu. Uh, taking a look at the Logitech Wave keyboard, probably the most ergonomic and comfortable keyboard uh, that I've ever seen for the PC. Uh, and of course works on the Mac as well. We're going to be looking at that. And also just announcing our first anniversary party. This is really cool. We're going to be uh, hosting a special show on Tuesday, September 23rd. Mark it on your calendar. And certainly if you're going to be in the Barrie area, uh, you're going to want to come on out because we are going to be broadcasting for the first time with a live studio audience. Refreshments are going to be served. It's going to be a great time. Uh, we're going to have a meet and greet before the show. Uh, needless to say, you can get on over to Category5.tv, find out more about our first anniversary broadcast. Um, and also visit us uh, on that website, Category5.tv, and cast your vote. Uh, the current vote question is, of all the tech shows on the web, uh, of all the te tech shows, pardon me, uh, just in general, uh, Category5 is dot dot dot, and you fill in the blank. So we're interested to know what you think of Category5, and uh, we'll take it from there. So get on over to Category5.tv, cast your votes. Uh, you're watching Category5. How many times can I say the name of the show? Get it embedded in your heads. Anyways, it's Category5.tv. We've got a live chat room right there right now uh, just to uh, answer all of your questions. Um, so if you're going to join us in the chat room, that's the best way to get your questions in. We also have email live at Category5.tv. And, of course, as I was saying before, the, uh, the phone line is 705-739-1056. Welcome to everybody who's in the chat room so far. It's good to see us. G-Dog wishing Natalia a happy birthday. Thank you. All right, just looking at the chat room here. Chet was mentioning that he'd like to be able to keep the TV window always on top of the chat. Um, you can actually use our hybrid player if you'd like, uh, our, our hybrid chat room. If you go to uh, category5.tv slash chat slash hybrid dot html. I'm going to post that right here for you. And that uh, URL is going to give you the hybrid chat, which has the player and the chat room as well. Um, if you're actually looking to keep like an always on top for the window, uh, because you're on Windows, the way that you'd want to do that, let's see, we've covered it in one of our broadcasts. So I'm just going to actually just do a quick search through our uh, episode index. Guess we can get rid of that now, eh? All right, 
right, so I'm just going to do a search category 5 always on top. Our search is always down at the bottom uh, left-hand side of the website. Here we go, episode number eight. Going way back. Viewer question that came in was, how do I make Windows, i.e. the Category 5 live stream, display always on top in Windows XP so that my other applications load beneath it? So if you check out episode number eight, we address that issue for you. Um, that'll get you, get you by with that. And of course, in Linux, it's a little different. It's a lot... Uh, it's a little simpler because all we have to do is just right click on any window and choose always on top so that's really really sleek So we do have a lot to cover tonight, but um, you know I do want to kind of let this open up to uh, questions and things, and I see that a couple of emails are coming in, so I'm going to deal with those first, uh, just to take care of all of you. Question coming in from John, John um, from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm sure glad I found the site. Hope to learn lots about Ubuntu Hardy Heron. I'm having terrible problems getting a display to fit my monitor. I'm running Hardy Heron 804 in a virtual machine in VMware uh, server 1.04. It all works uh, once I get the screen to fit. Seems stuck on one resolution, won't allow me to change it. My system is an old Dell 4550. Works great, no need to change. XP Home Service Pack 2 as the host. I remember I had a rough time setting things up initially with Gutsy, but forgot about what those settings were. I'd have I hope during the upgrade it would uh, detect the, the screen settings, uh, use some combination of alt and other keys to accept screen settings, and it would display inside my margins as desired, but not now. Thanks for a great show from John. Thanks for your email, John. Uh, I think the control key sequence that you're looking for is control, alt, and then use your plus and minus keys. So control, alt, plus, 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 until you find a resolution that will, uh, that will basically just cycle through all the various resolutions that are available for your display. Because you're running in a virtual machine, uh, it might be detecting a little odd. Um, so you might want to actually, um, I guess it depends on whether you've actually got Ubuntu installed or whether you're still working with the, uh, the live CD. If you're still on the live CD, try booting it instead uh, using safe graphics mode. And that's going to kind of uh, bypass the automatic detection of your monitor. And because you're using a virtual machine under Windows XP, it, you know, it, it could vary what kind of results you're going to uh, receive from that. So... Uh, best thing to do would be try booting from the, the live CD uh, with safe uh, graphics mode. Press F4 when you boot from the hardy disk, and that will give you that option. And then uh, and then install it using that. But um, control alt plus and minus is going to change your resolution, and then we can look at things like your xorg.conf file. Are you joining us in the chat room right now, John? Because if you are, just let me know so that uh, we can kind of run some things by you just to find out what you've tried already. Um, and if not, then I'll just kind of keep spouting ideas at you, but um, just in case you catch this after the fact. And then we can correspond in the forum or by email. But, um, yeah, that would be where I'd start. And then we can look at xorg.conf. So you can look at, uh, you know, just do a search for that if um, if you're not in the chat room. xorg.conf. That's your configuration for uh, x... Uh, the X windowing environment, so that's going to allow you to, you know, you can change the resolution that way uh, by setting specific resolutions within your uh, within your X configuration. Chet says, "Thanks, Robbie. Got it. Even in Windows, that's the uh, always on top thing. That's what you mean. No problem." So, John, I, ho I hope that kind of points you in the right direction. Doesn't look like you're joining us in the chat room. Uh, but hopefully that will give you a hand, or at least get you started, anyway. So, but I would like to hear that that works. I personally wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. Oh, you're uh, emailing me. Great. Okay. 
So you're not in the chat room, but I'll check your emails here. Um, John, I would personally, like, the first thing I would ask is why are you using Windows as your as your host operating system? Uh, because it, it, typically it is better to use Linux as the host because then you're going to get all the, like, the 3D effects and things like that, plus a non-fragmenting file system, um, and then install Windows into that. But I guess if you, it, it really depends on what you're using it for. Um, if you're just using it to try Linux, it's just gonna it's gonna strip some of the most advanced, cool features of Linux because uh, your Windows XP is not going to allow you to virtualize the uh, the hardware acceleration of your graphics card, so you're not gonna get the 3D stuff. So, uh, so just looking over the new emails here from John, looks like that's a duplicate. Oh, okay, just looks okay. All right, so I'm just going to read John's email because I got to get out of the habit. I said last week I got to get out of the habit of trying to read it first and then change it, translate it to you. So I'm just going to read it. Um, so no sending me emails with cuss words because you know you never know. Uh, hopefully we'll catch it. Uh, sure glad I found your site. The best. He's got that in capital letters, so I'm not actually accent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, have tried some of your tips. Great. I have Ubuntu Hardy up and running. Okay. I have an old Dell 4550 with 64 megabytes of DDR NVIDIA GE Force. Oh, see, you scared me there for a second. I thought, is it 64 megabytes of actual RAM or 64 megabit, um, a megabyte NVIDIA card? Because 64 megabytes of RAM, if that's what you're talking about there, is really low. Um, saying it's too old to handle comp is, uh, NVIDIA GE Force 4. Yeah, that's pretty old. That's like a, that's like, um, what do you call it? Old. Uh, but yeah, definitely a little too, uh, like with 64 megs of RAM, I don't even know how you could, that'd be really slow. Uh, okay, uh, main problem. I can't listen to many of my podcasts. I have the, all the repositories that are required, but they won't play as Windows XP with M Player. Uh, your show does fine uh, as Twit Live does. Uh, thanks for a great show. John in Dallas. So John, um, so you're having trouble, so you, it sounds to me like you've you've gotten Windows off there or something, and you've gone and put Ubuntu as your core operating system, so you're no longer doing this through a virtual machine. Um, so what we need to do to get those podcasts working, uh, why don't you try a program called Miro? Have you ever tried that? It sounds like you're using uh, mPlayer, which is, um, which is okay, but I would go with uh, Miro, which uses mPlayer, but it also gets all the codecs for you. It says, forgot to mention, I'm running XP Home Service Pack 2 and VMware Server with Hardy in it. Okay, so you are still doing the virtual machine. Dude, let me know about the RAM thing. Because if you've only got 64 megs of RAM and you're using Windows XP plus a virtual machine within that, then you do not have enough RAM. Period. So just post me right back as soon as you... Uh, I hope that you're watching live. It could have been just a fluke that you emailed me at the same time that I was talking about you. Yeah? but let's see what you say about that. If that's, well, I won't touch it just now. I'll pretend that you have 512 megs or more. Um, in the meantime, you the reason that you're not going to be able to do comp is, comp is fusion, the 3D stuff and the special effects, is because you're using a virtual machine. What a virtual machine does is it virtualizes hardware. So when you install Ubuntu into a virtual machine, it's not able to run comp is fusion because it's using it's using it doesn't have any 3d hardware because it's all virtual uh, you need Ubuntu to be your host operating system so that you can get all the 3d stuff and then you can install um, Windows into that because there's no 3d in Windows so no nobody cares right um, unless you're doing gaming then it's a different thing and then we look at things like um, uh, dual booting so that you can boot into Windows uh, by itself but certainly the reason that you're unable to get the 3d in the virtual machine is because it's a virtual machine <clears throat> so I'm going to watch uh, watch my email there for you, John, just in case you are responding to me. In the meantime, I've got another one coming in here from Holly. It says that she's, uh, okay, again, see, I almost started doing it. Got to get out of that habit. Okay, so I have one partition, and she actually said so. She started the sentence with so. See how that works? So I have one partition on my hard drive, but I want two. Does that mean that if I were to add an external partition, I'd have to reformat it all? I think she means an extra partition. Um, so typically, yes. If you wanted to have two partitions, you've got to delete the first partition, add a 
partition that's smaller and then a partition that's bigger. That's how it works in Windows, unless you buy commercial software like Partition Magic, which is magical, uh, but it costs money. So what we're going to look at today is uh, being able to use free software to make this happen. And um, essentially, you know, I looked at a couple products. I even tried, uh, you know, with a couple of different boot CDs and things. And it just came back to Ubuntu. I love the way that G, uh, GNOME Partition Editor works. So, you know what? I'm just going to suggest that you get uh, a copy of Ubuntu. And you, you can go over to uh, Category5.tv and check out episode, I think it was 30, 32, uh, where we introduced Ubuntu Hardy. Now, I'm going to tell you why I want to do this. I just want to confirm that that's the episode number. Episode 32, yeah. Uh, in episode 32, the reason that I want to point you towards that episode is because um, in that show, I teach you right from the get-go how to go on to the website at Ubuntu, download the uh, the program, burn it to a CD. I get into that a little bit with, uh, with Linux. I know, Holly, that you're in Windows, um, so you'll need to use your Windows uh, CD burner software, but it's fairly straightforward as long as you burn the ISO correctly. Uh, just follow the directions in your in your program or ask on the show when I know specifically what program you're using. Uh, but it will go through that. So what you need to do is download the Ubuntu desktop uh, for i386 uh, edition. Okay, so follow through. That's in episode number 32. And then from there, it's going to allow you to boot into Ubuntu without affecting your hard drive, like without actually having to install it. So, so when you're watching episode 32, stop at the point where I start installing Ubuntu because instead what we want to do is we just want to use the live CD. This is going to also show you a little bit about how you can use uh, Ubuntu as a recovery disk. Um, it works really, really well to uh, restore damaged files on your Windows system, especially since Gutsy with uh, NTFS writing and Hardy, of course, as well. Um, so, you know, that, in layman's terms, that means we can edit files that are on a Windows computer just by using a boot CD. So if you can't boot your Windows computer, this can be used uh, as a great tool for fixing that computer. Um, so I'm just going to jump over here. I've just uh, put the CD in my drive and boot it up VirtualBox. Um, so Holly, you're going to see this when you first uh, run that CD that you're going to burn from uh, episode number 32, and it's free software. But the reason that I want you to do this, even though we're not going to be installing Ubuntu, uh, what we are going to do is go System. Let's find my mouse here. Administration, okay, and then just go down. And unfortunately, uh, VirtualBox doesn't handle the zoom very well. Um, Let's see, there it is, Partition Editor, okay? So we're just going to click on Partition Editor, and this is just so simple for you. Like, this is just such an easy way to uh, edit your partition. And for those who are not familiar with this, the um, advantage to this is that we're, like I say, going to be able to uh, edit the partition without damaging the data. So we're actually going to resize the partition on that external drive or on the internal drive even, make a new partition. This can be a great tool if you want to, uh, you know, if you've already got Windows XP installed and you want to dual boot, uh, but you didn't think to dual, part uh, dual partition your computer, this is going to get around that because we're going to create that new partition now. So Holly, once you've brought up that partition editor, you're going to see this window here, and I'm going to try to zoom in here. Okay. So over here, you're going to see a pull-down list. Now, I've only got an SDA. What that means is it's the first um, serial ATA drive on my computer. So just uh, pretty much observe the size. You're probably going to have two. Plug in that external drive, that uh, USB drive, if that's the one you're working with, or uh, if you're working with your internal, whatever. Just keep in mind, you know, this says 8 gigabytes. So I know that this is the drive because it's 8 gigabytes. If your drive is, say, um, let's say your drive is a 400 gigabyte external drive, then you want to select the one in the list that's the 400 gig drive. You don't want to damage your C drive. You don't want to mess around with the wrong drive. So make sure you are working with the proper drive, okay? So select it from that pull down list. And then you're going to see the, uh, there's the NT file system on this drive right now. So you can see that on my eight gig drive, I've got an NT file system, okay? So all I have to do, Holly, is just right click on that and you can see resize and move. Now watch out for things like delete because remember this could be destructive. You could damage your data if you're not careful. So instead we want to resize and move. So once I've clicked on that, it brings up this nice little resize window and I can just grab this guy over here on the right hand side and look at how easy it is to resize that partition. Now if I had data on this, it's gonna show me you know, where I can go to. Uh, I can pretty much resize it as much as I want, but if you had this much data on it, it would only let you go that far. So I'm going to put it about, you know, let's say about halfway. 
and then just hit resize. So now you can see I've got my drive there. That's my first partition, which used to take up the entire drive. Now it only takes up about a half, a little bit more than a half. So, you know, that's what we want. So now where it says unallocated, that's now an empty space on that drive. I can right click on that and choose new. And then this is where, you know, I can set the size, but I'm just going to let it take up the entire size of the partition that, uh, that we just created by moving the, uh, the other one. And just check the file system here. This is the only thing that you need to do. Um, just set it to an appropriate file system. So ext2 and ext3 are for Linux. FAT16 is for small uh, DOS files. FAT32 uh, is for, it can handle larger DOS files, but still a two, two gigabyte limit. Um, so what you want to do is look down here for NTFS because you're on an NT file system. Um, that's probably the one that you're going to want. So just select NTFS and then go add. So now you can see that our original STA1, which is your first partition on the hard drive, is down to 4.8 gigs, where it used to be 8 gigs. And now the new partition is 3.2 gigs. So now we have two, partition. now we two partitions. Now we just hit apply and then apply that. All right. And it's going to go through the entire uh, process of repartitioning the drive. So it didn't actually do it up to that point. So if you needed to stop what you were, let's say you completely messed up, you could just like abort, press undo, close the program, say no. Uh, but now that I've finalized that, it's actually repartition, repartitioning that hard drive. And that's as easy as it is. That'll work with uh, external drives. You plug in your USB drive and fire it up. Ubuntu will immediately uh, pick it up. Um, and then you just click on it in the places menu and then uh, that will mount it and you can but you don't even need to mount it you can just uh, you can just use that uh, gnome uh, partition editor all right everybody in the chat room any questions for me how do i pronounce that name <laughs> mb havaraju good to see you first time here i take it indeed it's good to see you though call me raj all right raj where are you from? Irving, Texas. So we've got a couple of uh, new viewers from the Texas area. I'm doing well. Oh, where am I from? I'm uh, in. We're in Barrie, Ontario, Canada, about an hour north of Toronto. pretty neat seeing all the uh, you know all new faces from all over the place and you know knowing that a couple of new viewers are from Texas it makes you wonder like like how did you find us Raj just through a website or weather here has been uh, really nice lately a little too hot but um, uh, today was a little rainy but you know not too bad most of the rain came down overnight oh uh, Raj heard about Ustream on Fox tonight and uh, came over to Ustream to check it out. So yeah, Ustream is a pretty great service and that's, they, uh, they host our show. So, you know, we can't, uh, we sure can't complain. <laughs> so I'm glad you uh, found Category 5. Uh, we're actually hosted at Category5.tv, so we use Ustream for the stream uh, live. Uh, but of course, our website features a lot more stuff on there. You can get us on DVD, uh, you can subscribe to the RSS feed. Uh, you can join us in the forums and uh, all that stuff throughout the week. So make sure you check out our actual official website as well because uh, there's a lot more going on to Category 5 than just what's on Ustream. Great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, G-Dog. All right. Moving along. Uh, okay, looking at Ubuntu, right? What operating system are you on, Raj? We've all brought up the screensavers dialog, right? So, because you want to have a cool screensaver on your computer. One of the beautiful things I love about Linux is that it comes with a ton of screensavers. Some of them are ridiculously uncool. Uh, some of them are really cool. Uh, I love uh, the, the fireworks. Uh, what is it? X Skyrocket. Uh, that's one of my favorites, and it always seems to impress. And especially, you know, when you have your friends over who have the little Windows XP logo moving around on their screen. Or worse, uh, Starscape that hasn't been modified or improved since... Uh, what Windows 95? So nice to uh, nice to have a couple of really cool screensavers. Um, so on my computer with Linux with the default installation uh, on Ubuntu, you get all these screensavers. Like look at that. I've got to scroll through this list that's just massive. But the problem with this, as cool as this is, you'll notice that there's no button for settings or options or anything like that. So if you've got you know your pictures slideshow and stuff, it, there's no option to select which folder 
you want to grab those pictures from. <coughs> Pardon me. If you've got text, let's find one here with text. Um, then you're, you, there's no way to change what the text displays because there's no uh, configuration file. There's no configuration program in Ubuntu. Why this is, we may never know. We may never know. It's just one of those things that doesn't make any sense. But tonight on Category 5, we're going to fix it. We're going to make it better for you. There's some really cool screensavers in here. Are you guys, were you watching this when I was scrolling through? I mean, there's some really cool stuff. I love this stuff. Like, boom, how cool is that? <laughs> it's like a whole bunch of mini tadpoles swimming around in a cube. And as you know, we love cubes. There's one. Just spinning around with the, uh, <laughs> with my kernel version. Wow, how cool is that? That wouldn't impress my friends. So very similar to the uh, Windows XP 3D text, uh, but we want to be able to change the text because, you know, why do I want to just display my kernel version? That's pretty lame. So you can see, though, that there isn't anything to do any kind of configuration here. Pretty lame. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a program uh, that's going to allow us to make these changes. So I'm just going to close right out of the default Ubuntu uh, screensaver settings window. and. Oh, uh, Raj is on Windows 2000 and Windows XP. Make sure you check out last week's show, Raj, because we looked at uh, a cool program that let us kind of improve the uh, graphical representation of Windows XP, make it look cooler, make it look nicer. Uh, so you definitely want to check that out. Let's see here. That was episode number 37. Got to look in the right place here. Here we go. Okay, the program is called <laughs> XFX Screensaver Settings. I'm going to put a link to this up on the uh, Category 5 website under the show notes for this episode, number 38. Um, so you definitely want to check this out. This is great if you're on Ubuntu. Uh, this program, I'm going to put a link right to this page for you so that you can get there easily. Now, it says that it's for Ubuntu 7.10. I'm running 8.04, and it works just dandy. So all you have to do here... Click on XFX Screensaver Settings. Right now it's point oh, uh, 0 0.3. It could be a different version by the time you see this. But I've just, pardon me, I've just clicked on that. And that's just going to download a DEB file. And in Linux, a DEB file is a Debian installer. So um, basically like, like a setup.exe if, if you're used to Windows. Uh, a little easier than that, though. It's going to get all your dependencies and everything. It's unfortunate that, the, that this program is not in the repository uh, for Ubuntu. But, you know, what, what can we do? So we're going to get around it by installing it right from this website. So we're just going to open it with GW Package Installer and hit OK. Nice and small program. It's going to come up quite fast. All right, here it comes. There. OK. So that's our downloader. Here comes GW Installer. There. OK, so this is the package installer for Ubuntu. The computer that I'm using uh, Ubuntu on tonight is, is a little slower than you're used to. Uh, just, you know, we're trying to utilize our resources as best as we can. But uh, so basically that program there has come up and it just tells you a little bit about what XFX screensaver settings does. And normally this would just say install package. Mine says reinstall package because I've already done it. So I'll actually click on reinstall just because I want you to see how easy this is. Um, so it's going to automatically, it's going to actually remove the version that I had already installed. And it's going to go through and uh, and reinstall it. But it, that's it. I don't have to do anything more. There's no settings that I have to configure, no nothing. <coughs> okay. I think it's done in the background. I'm just going to check. So let's pull it up. Uh, it should be under System. Now we're going to have System, Preferences, and then you normally you go to Screensaver. Now we're going to go to Screensaver-Settings. You see the difference there? Screensaver, right below it says Screensaver-Settings. Screensaver-Settings is exactly what we're looking for. Boom. Let's maximize that. Now we've got that same list of Screensavers, but what do you have here? See if I can zoom in here without losing it. See down at the bottom left there? Options. Sweet. Click it. 
So we've got GL text. Here's the options. I can change the way that it rotates on the axis, uh, change the speed, wander around, change it to wireframe. Let's just put, uh, let's put, hey Raj, let's see if it works. The automatic, uh, the automatic, uh, th this, this computer has a couple of little glitches here, but this does work. I promise you that. I've got a bit of an issue right now. Bah, bah. Let's force it. <laughs> you can get the, uh, you can get the idea of what that does and how well it works. Oh, there we go. screensaver settings Raj what are you talking about you'll be in trouble if what doesn't work oh if the screensaver because I was saying hey this particular computer that I'm using for the for uh, because I'm actually streaming it as well the 3d gets kind of whacked when I do uh, 3d stuff but it does work I did it offline and it works just fine See, if I, if I type it real fast, then it might be okay. Yeah! I did it! I typed it fast enough. <laughs> Raj. Anyway, so there's my new screensaver. So you can just see how, you know, now we can actually manipulate our screensaver uh, settings. So that's very cool. I know that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of people have looked for within, uh, within Ubuntu. So, yeah, it seems to work really well. Give it a go. Let me know what you think of it. But uh, definitely, I mean, it, it solves the problem of not having that feature in Ubuntu. So, and there's a lot of screensavers. I love uh, the GL slideshow. It just is beautiful the way that it pans in and out your uh, your photos and things like that. So, but I need to specify which folder I wanted to pull the photos from, and it didn't uh, didn't have that option. So, is uh, Chosen joining us yet? Chosen, you had a question for me. I'm just going to pull him up on MSN just in case. No emails coming in at the moment. All right. Everybody's having a good week so far? How Field got Firefox update today. Woohoo! Finally, version 3.0. Except version 3 isn't out yet. What gives? How is that possible? Yeah, aren't they at release candidate 4? I thought. Let us do some investigating. But yeah, I've got uh, Firefox 3. And there's a couple of features that they actually stripped that were in the beta 5 that I liked. Like when you closed it, it used to ask if you'd like to save and exit. I liked that. I thought that was cool. Now I still have to use, I still have to kill my browser if I want it to bring back up the same web pages after I come back. Um, huh. Looking, looking. C2. Oh, they've released what's called a sneak peek of Firefox 3, so I wonder if that's what they've done. But I'm sure that Ubuntu has, uh, you know, pretty close ties with Firefox as well, with Mozilla. See, it's not just, uh, oh, yeah, see, I was having trouble there with, uh, even with Firefox on this particular computer, so... Don't think it was the screensaver settings that was causing my computer to do that. Boy, that computer's laggy. <laughs> I'm going to have to upgrade. Send your donations, please. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I don't know what the story behind that is. On their website, is it released Candidate 2 on Firefox? Mozilla.com. So I don't know. No idea. It is cool, though. Nice to have a... It's pretty stable now. I can... I think I can bring up, uh, let's let's find out, um, the uh, initial release candidate that came, or the beta that was uh, included with Ubuntu Hardy was ho horrible. They fixed it up a little bit over the first couple of weeks of Hardy, but um, it was always crashing. Um, Google Calendar was was the big one that was really um, unbelievable that, it, that they released it without it even supporting Google Calendar. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, so obviously they've uh, they've tweaked it. Google Calendar came up. That's great. So, boom, there it is. Before it used to just like if it would freak out the browser completely. So. So, how many of you work in an office environment where you're sitting at a computer for, say, you know, eight hours at a time, or, um, you know, even just for five hours? I mean, <laughs> we got to start thinking about things like ergonomics, right? Ergonomics are not economics, but they should be taught in school. Ergonomics deals with, uh, you know, your workstation, how uh, comfortable it is for your body how your uh, body reacts to, uh, you know, the interface that you have to your computer. Mice in particular, you know, you, you get these, the pains in your wrist and things like that if you're on it for too long. Um, and certainly keyboards are one of those inventions that, you know, just haven't been hugely improved over the past 20 years. I mean, since the initial, you know, PCs were, were starting to hit the market, they were all the, the ASDF uh, QWERTY keyboards. Um, and they all kind of stayed with the same pattern and the same design. Um, so I set out to find a keyboard for my desk that uh, was going to work a lot better for me. And just to show you kind of what I was working with, and you know that I you know, have had trouble over the past little while, this is typically what you think of when you think of a keyboard, right? But it's not really ergonomic at all. It's not good for you at all. When you're typing on this keyboard, I mean, you basically have to have your arms like this if you were to actually be typing on the keyboard the way that uh, you're supposed to be typing. So it's pretty unbelievable. But your, your arms naturally are going to fall into this kind of formation. So like if you put your hands in front of you, think, okay, that's how my hands fall. Look at where your fingers are. And then compare that to where your fingers should be on a keyboard if the keyboard were ergonomic. So actually try that with me right now. Put your hands out like this uh, comfortably and then put them over your keyboard and just be like, wow, that's pretty horrible, right? Because my keys are actually, I've got to twist my arms like this if I'm going to get in there. And you can feel as you do that, that it's, you know, tensing up these muscles up here, back here. And it's certainly bad for, you know, your, your ulnar nerve and your, uh, you've heard of um, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome as well. And that's, that's another thing that we need to think about if we're going to be sitting at a computer for any length of time. So looking at ergonomics, I picked up for myself a Logitech Wave keyboard. And you cannot, just for the record, you can't say Logitech Wave Keyboard without lowering your voice like that. You have to pull off the radio voice. Otherwise, you know, you're just not doing it right. Because this is so sexy. Okay, so this keyboard here, I'm going to try to show that it's actually plugged in and I'm not unplugging it. So you can see that the uh, contours here, this is the, uh, you know, the contour design. So you get that, um, the curve to the keyboard without actually splitting the keyboard down the middle. Most uh, ergonomic keyboards that you've seen in the past have been split in the middle. How annoying is that? That makes it even worse, right? So this has taken it one step further than the Microsoft uh, Comfort Curve keyboard, and it's also added the wave design. If you look here, hopefully you can kind of see, it actually has a really nice contour like this. So when I sit at this keyboard, I'm going to just set it up here so that you can kind of see. When I put my arms out like this and then I put them down, I can tell that they thought this through because my fingers rest exactly where the keys are on this keyboard. They're perfectly contoured, perfect wave. Um, so this keyboard, um, it's not very expensive, runs uh, anywhere from about 50 to $60 Canadian, but um, it does include the multimedia keys. Just kind of taking a look here. Um, 
got a couple notes that I really want to touch on. Um, the uh, the media keys surround kind of the keyboard. They're set up essentially for uh, Windows Vista, uh, but there is a program called KeyTouch for uh, Linux for Ubuntu, uh, and it's it's in a beta phase right now. So once um, 2.4, I think it's 2.4 uh, that comes out uh, of beta, then we're going to start seeing that in Linux as well. So right now these multimedia keys don't work too well in Linux. The standard ones like volume and things like that do, uh, but the uh, the extra ones like the ability to have zoom and task switcher and things like that. It's going to be really cool because this will uh, inevitably work with uh, Compass Fusion, but that's coming. Um, also, uh, on top of those uh, those keys, just there's this uh, nice palm rest, which is also part of the ergonomic system, but it's not like a solid plastic. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a foam, um, but it is kind of cushioned, so you can kind of feel that your wrist is. Uh, a little more comfortable on that than it would be on plastic, and like Logitech, they I mean they build a high-end quality product that's built to last, and that is well reflected by the five-year warranty that's included with the Wave. And of course, now you can see that I'm like yanking on this cord here; it's a USB cord. Um, this is available in a wireless uh, edition as well. This is probably the only time I'm ever going to hold this up from my desk, so you know I didn't really need the cordless, but um, yeah, beautiful keyboard. I give it an eight out of ten. Uh, I would I would have loved to see Logitech actually support uh, the uh, the project uh, KeyTouch that's uh, setting this keyboard up for uh, multimedia use in Linux. Unfortunately, uh, Logitech is only supporting officially Mac and Windows, so uh, I would have really that probably would have given them at least another point had they uh, had they uh, maybe supported that project and uh, sped things up with that. But definitely, uh, just as a keyboard itself, it's pretty well perfect. So. You're watching Category 5 Technology TV, and I'm Robbie Ferguson, your host. Glad to have everybody here with me. Uh, we are online at Category5.tv, and we've got a chat room there if you want to join me, and uh, I'm here to answer your questions. Boy, oh boy, this, this particular computer is running slow. <laughs> you know what it probably is, is? It's a slow computer, and we've still got that virtual machine running, so I'm going to kill that. Come on, puppy. Boom. If you have any questions for me, just get into uh, category5.tv. Join me in the chat room. That's the quickest way to get a question in. Windjammer, good to see you. Glad you made it tonight. Catman's here. Hey, hello. And Chosen, welcome. Glad to see you. You had a question for me, Chosen, before the show. Um, could you just run that by me again? People who ask questions before the show, eh? <laughs> it, it's pretty busy ten minutes before broadcast. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's really busy. Okay, Chosen removed a partition from his USB flash drive, wondering how he can fix it. Do you need to recover the data that's on that? Or do you just need to fix the drive so that you can use it again? Can we just wipe the, forget about the data? Ah, oh, he's gonna make it difficult. He wants the data back. This is where we were talking, Holly, about don't delete your partition. Unless you got a backup or something. Okay. Huh. Let's see. <laughs> I, I'm not sure of a free tool that does it, Chosen. I mean, usually I try to promote the free stuff on the show. Don't try FDisk. He's saying he's going to try FDisk. That's destructive. If you use FDisk, you're going to create a new partition that's going to overwrite the partition table of the original partition, and your data is gone. Even harder to obtain. I'm just going to see what kind of commercial product, products. Is the data worth enough to you to uh, to pay a couple bucks for uh, recovery? I'll see if there's a free software for partition recovery, but. 
but any that I've ever used are uh, are commercial. Okay, so he's willing to buy something. Yeah, Norton Disk Tools Raj is, uh, wow, like you say, way back a long time ago. Like the old Norton Disk Doctor and Unerase. Those were the days. Early data recovery. What uh, file system was it? FAT32? Yeah, usually, like usually, a U, like it's a flash disk, right? So it's probably going to be FAT32, <coughs> as opposed to NTFS. But uh, it really depends. But there is a product um, called Handy Recovery, but it is going to cost you fifty-two dollars. Like, so you're looking at, uh, you know, let's say about thirty pounds, upwards of almost that. Handy Recovery is a data recovery software designed to restore accidentally lost files. Moving along, it says, this tool can recover files from deleted and formatted partitions. So I think that's kind of the tool that you're looking for. And it works with uh, FAT12, 1632, NTFS, and NTFS5. And it says EFS file systems. Windjammer's off. Take care, man. Is that uh, is that price point reasonable for you, G Dog? That's handy recovery. I'm gonna see if I can find anything else for you. NTFS undelete. If it was NTFS, that would be nice. That's free. Deleted partitions. PC Inspector. Oh. <laughs> I I just I'm like I'm always kind of weary about these kind of programs that are just available for free because a lot of times they can come with some spyware and stuff. But that's not to say uh, I would be, I'd be willing to try this. Uh, PC Inspector File Recovery finds partitions automatically, even if the boot sector or FAT have been erased or damaged. Recovers files with the original time and date stamp. Supports the saving of recovered files on network drives. Sounds pretty brilliant. Um, but again, I'm, I've never tried it, so. But that's free according to their website. At least it says it doesn't cost anything. So I'll, uh, I'll post links to in the, uh, on, on the Category 5 website under uh, show number 38 for you chosen. Yeah, you definitely... Yeah, Howe was mentioning that some of these free ones will s conduct the scan and then charge you if you want to uh, actually recover the files. But this says that it recovers files with the original time and date. And that says... PC Inspector File Recovery 4.x is so-called freeware. This means that the software does not cost you a single penny. That's what it says on their site. Whether it's false advertising to get you to... Hard to say without trying. It's certainly a lot cheaper than $3,000 data recovery. I'm going to look at this link that How Field just gave me.
uh, just looking at undelete plus. It doesn't look like it does partitions, though. It's only for files, I think. How? Which is too bad, because it has a PC world stamp, so you kind of like to see that little bit of legitimacy. Chosen, do you have a, uh, a working environment, like in a virtual machine, that you can use for the actual data recovery? Like, because I'd, I'd love you to try these programs, but if if one of them has like spyware or something we don't want to we don't want to do that on a production system so you'd almost want to use a virtual machine or just a system that you can wipe out or whatever after we're done um, and then try one of these free programs first just don't do anything that writes to the disk until you're certain that it's doing the right you know what any data recovery software should never write to the disk itself it's going to write to something else it's going to ask you to save it to your hard drive or a network drive or something like that. So if it's if it's illegitimate, it's gonna like if it's gonna restore it on the disk itself, that's gonna just cause further corruption. So don't allow that. Does this help you at all? <laughs> I hope. There's a couple of uh, program names for you, anyways. But I'll I'll link to them in the show notes. I just noticed I've got GOS up here. Sweet. You're watching Category 5 Technology TV, and I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. Uh, I'm a technologist from Barrie, Ontario, and good to have everybody along tonight. If you're uh, new to the show, just get on over to Category5.tv. We've got lots of great things over there, the RSS feeds, the uh, chat room, the forum. Uh, we've got uh, a text area, stuff to read with some product reviews and uh, even some tips and tricks. So check out our website, Category5.tv, and certainly if you're watching live right now, join us in the chat room, get your question in. We've got uh, just about... Just a few more minutes left of the broadcast, and uh, you know if I'm able to squeeze in your question, that's great. All right, no problem, chosen. Says that was helpful. Sure, hope so. GOS, how is a uh, whole bunch of Google stuff, but now they've uh, they've released a GOS uh, Space, which is uh, the latest edition, but it's it's already obsolete because it doesn't support Hardy. But anyways. Uh, it's pretty cool. Anyways, GOS, we'll maybe look at it sometime once they've perfected the uh, Hardy implementation. But, uh, yeah, this has just got all of your... Let's see. It's got, like, a nice little dock bar at the bottom. It's very much meant to be uh, for, like, EPCs and cloud books and things like that. Actually, I think the cloud book comes with GOS. It's another free uh, Linux operating system. But this this particular version that I've got running here is uh, the Google desktop version. So it's got all the main Google programs. You can just... It's got hot links to, uh, like, Google Calendar and Gmail, things like that. It's designed to uh, to really use the Web 2.0 applications, and I, I like that. Uh, when I get my EPC, that's exactly what I'm going to be doing, is storing all my stuff on the web and just accessing it through Wi-Fi. So uh, that's kind of the idea behind GOS is uh, do everything online, leave the files off your hard drive so that you don't need to... Uh, you know, you don't need to uh, have a massive hard drive because it, you get into a solid state drive in a notebook and that note, you know, if it's a two gig drive, obviously you can't store any files on it, but it is super fast. The link for GOS is thinkgos.com. And like I say, space is out and it is gorgeous. I love it, but it's buggy. Uh, when you do the updates, it uh, it kind of monkeys it up really bad. And But they know about it. They've got a post here from May 7th that says that uh, we found that running the system update to Ubuntu 8.04 will break GOS space and rocket. This is our bad and we apologize. And then dot, 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 so you can read more. So obviously they know that's a problem. Um, so I'm not going to complain too much about it because I expect that they're going to be fixing it. And boy, they do a beautiful uh, a beautiful user interface. And it's based on the same stuff that we do in Ubuntu Hardy uh, with uh, Avant Window Navigator and things like that, but it is really, uh, you know, built to be uh, used for online stuff. G-Dog, uh, oh, the version that I've got running up here, this is the uh, Rocket Edition. So this is not the Space Edition. This is the uh, Google Rocket. You'll notice it's green. <laughs> but it is pretty lovely. I love dock bars. It's free, yeah. It's 
based on Ubuntu, so it's got you know the benefits there, but um, but it does break. The current version breaks if you install the updates too hardy. I think uh, GDoc once uh, once they've kind of fixed up that little issue with uh, with GOS, we'll um, we'll do a review on the show. I like to kind of give you a little bit of a flavor of the different uh, Linux operating systems, and you know let you let you see what's out there. Um, Seven point ten, yeah, it would be it would be gutsy. It would be based on gutsy, but it's not actually gutsy. It's it's called GOS, but there's a lot of derivatives of Ubuntu now. Even uh, Linspire and Freespire are now based on Ubuntu rather than right out of the Debian fork. So, because uh, I guess because uh, Ubuntu has just got such a great, um, you know, like they they're constantly uh, every six months it's it's to a T. They're always bringing out a new operating system with the latest features. So, helps uh, you know derivatives. It helps them to kind of look good <laughs> because they get all the latest features too. Any other questions for me in the chat room while we still have a couple of moments? Just kind of winding down here on Category 5. Uh, Hal's wondering if I'll be first in queue for the new iPhone. No, actually. <laughs> if they sent me a free one, I'd be I'd be happy to review it. But um, no, I'm more of a, uh, I mean, I don't have my phone on me, but I use a, a Sony Ericsson with uh with my jawbone at this point like that's how i'm using it right now and and for communication i'm i'm going to be getting an epc i mean i really want to get into or a cloud book i mean depending on what arrives first um just really start uh, using portable computers something that's really small with uh with wi-fi and start you know really using that as my communications medium How Fields mentioning that the new uh, the new iPhone is half the price. Yeah, that's kind of the talk, is that uh, the price is coming way down. But um, I guess you know I, I I won't speak too soon. But it's not really my kind of tech. It's kind of not not along the lines of what I'm into. That's just me. Can I have multiple boot sectors on my system? Right now I have Win 2000 server. Can I install GOS also on it? Yes, uh, Raj, what you need to do is, uh, we talked a little earlier about repartitioning your system, uh, but you can actually go through the installer of, say, GOS or Ubuntu um, and use the resize option in the installer. So as you're installing, it will ask you if you want to resize the current partition, and it will do that, and then it will also install the Grub bootloader so that when you first turn on your computer, it will ask you, do you want to uh, run Windows 2000 Server, or do you want to run Ubuntu or GOS? So that's the way to do that. Uh, you can ask that on a future broadcast um, if you you know if you actually want to get into that, but um, it's pretty straightforward. And I appreciate everybody who has watched tonight. This is Category Five, Episode Number Thirty Eight. Join us next week. We're going to be uh, just you know always uh, answering your questions. So get your questions into me by email this week, and of course in the chat room again on Tuesday night at seven Eastern time. Thanks for joining me at Category Five TV. I'm Robbie Ferguson. Have a great week. Take care, everybody. <laughs>